morning. How's everybody doing? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you. Y'all, y'all, can, y'all can speak louder than that. Good morning. How are you doing? Good morning. Good morning. Now, I want to give my disclaimer. We are an African centered people. And traditionally, in African culture, when someone speaks in the presence of elders, they have to ask for permission from the oldest person in the room to speak. Now, I don't want to get in trouble because I know sometimes you're not supposed to ask age. So I would like to know from the elders, do I have your permission to speak? You have our permission. Absolutely. So now, anything I say, you have to take up with them now because they told me I can speak. First off, I'd like to thank you for taking your time out to come on a Saturday morning to learn. Um, that is a tremendous testament of character because we have to understand that learning takes place not only within the confines and four walls of a school, but learning is any place that you go and at times we have to bring the school to the people. Mm-hmm. So to give you all a brief introduction, I'm a Winston-Salem born and bred native. My name is Jeffrey Barnes or Jeffrey X Barnes or Brother Jeff as I'm known in the community. Um, I'm a graduate of North Forsyth High School, came out in 1994. I'm a product of the Winston-Salem Forsyth County School System in the terms of formal education. Let me just put that out there. And I came back and I'm currently a teacher in the Forsyth County School System. I've been working with young people since year 2000, so roughly maybe 20 years. I started out working in residential treatment, transitioned from residential treatment to um, one-on-one services and then from one-on-one services to a juvenile justice facility. While I was at the juvenile justice facility, I began to see a lot of the same faces come in and out. So one day I was sitting around and I said, okay, I'm seeing these same people come in for the same behavior. Let me see what their education was like because I had to go to school there. So one day I went and looked over a young man's shoulder and I could see that he could barely write and his math skills were lacking. So at that point in time, I said, this is catching them at the end. Mm -hmm. I need to be proactive Mm -hmm. and get them before Mm -hmm. they get here. So that motivated me to go back, finish my education, and become a school teacher. So I've been in the school system then since about 2007. Um, Started out at Hill Middle School, Art Magnet Middle School. Then left Hill when they merged into Follow, took a year off from teaching because I kind of got burnt out. Came back at Carver High School, taught at Carver High School for a year. Houston was coming to recruit, went out to Houston, taught at a STEM early college, came back to Charlotte, now I'm back here at Woodson of the Sun County School System and Main Street Academy. So once again, that's me. That's all I'm gonna say about me. Now let's talk about the importance of us being here. We have our Representative Evelyn Terry here, and we're gonna talk about entrepreneurship and economics. A lot of times, as I said, our education has to take place outside of the school system. Everything that I learned of black history did not take place in North Forsyth High School. It took me to go to college, and when I got to college, to read for myself. And then I began to read for myself, then I began to learn the rich history of our people and our nation and our community as an international people. That's been my passion since 94. And that's how me and um, Ms. Woodbury met each other because I began to do lectures and stuff on campus about black history and things of that nature. But one area that I hate that I neglected was economics. But as I'm growing to mature, I'm realizing that economics plays a major part in our condition as a people. And one thing that we have to always remember, and a maxim that I like to carry into practice when I think about economics, is that business is one. E is, from a mathematical standpoint, is an equal sign. Mm -hmm. So that means that business equals warfare, Mm -hmm. meaning there are certain principles that take place. Mm -hmm. And these principles are that you have to protect your business, you have to protect your intelligence, and you do not allow people to know everything. Because we were oppressed as a people, one thing that they did and took away from us was the ability to read. Mm -hmm. Then they said that if you want to hide something from somebody, a black person, put it in a book. Mm -hmm. 
And to this day, we're still having that happen. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it, it is incumbent upon us in the community to tell our story. Mm -hmm. Our children need to see us telling our story. Mm -hmm. When they begin to see us telling our story, then it will impact and garner a greater respect for us as a community. Mm -hmm. So our story needs to be told by us. Mm -hmm. And that's why I like to applaud the school board and Ms. Woodbury for taking this opportunity to come here and tell our story from our perspective. Right. Now, I'm going to stop because sometimes I can be a frustrated black preacher. I grew up in a Baptist church. So right now I'm going to stop because I'm not the center of attention. And I'm going to be a little techie because I'm a digital, I'm, I'm not technically a digital native, I'm a digital immigrant because I realize that learning is lifelong. I'm always learning new skills and new tricks to keep myself relevant. So typically I would have a sheet of paper and a podium to read off of, but we're going to be high tech today. A lot of young people are concerned with saving the trees and saving the planet, so I'm going to read off of this. So let's, let us represent, or let us welcome state representatives. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Right. Let us welcome State Representative Evelyn Terry. Ms. Evelyn Terry serves in the North Carolina General Assembly, District Number 71. No stranger to local, state, and national politics, Terry's leadership stems from the precinct level to public boards and commissions, including city council member. A strong advocate for women's rights and civil rights for all people, Evelyn Terry currently serves as a Forsyth County's DSS board chair. Community advocacy for children and the arts are also monikers that describe Terry. She is forthright and articulate about education as a foundation for successful living. She graduated from Johnson City Smith University. We'll let that slide up. <laughs> and received a master's degree from Appalachia State University. Right. Representative Terry's career includes extensive professional and executive management in both public and private sectors. Evelyn Terry is George Black's granddaughter. Oh. Mr. Black is the famous African American handmade brick maker who made thousands of bricks more than 50 years in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Her knowledge about small business and its importance to the economy comes directly from her working with her family's brick business. She is, currently the, she is currently the principal for the George Black House and Brickyard, a local landmark and national register of historic places site located at 111 Delaware Road in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Please put your hands together and welcome Ms. Evelyn. <laughs> plantation 
that um, was owned by a family, uh, the black family, basically. I don't know an awful lot about the, 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 the early, early rich history, but we did do a little bit of research back in 1970 on his 100th birthday, because the city of Winston-Salem actually celebrated his 100th birthday uh, in 1970 and sponsored a, it was the it was then I think called Urban Arts because even then we had a separate we had a, a white arts council and we had the Urban Arts Council so you had to have the, and and so the reality about the artistic side uh, I say the right and the left brain sometimes come together but the reality is that folks didn't think that that art could come together at that particular point in time so the reality was that it was kind of a catalyst for his 100th birthday to bring folks together. Mm -hmm. Because they, had, they sponsored it through the urban arts, but it, 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 got, it, it drew everybody. Mm -hmm. Everybody, everybody came. And the reason for that is, the reason that I will segue back to my life and my humble beginnings from that person who was born back in 1879, who at the age of 10 left Randolph County came to Forsyth County with his father and an older brother. He had, the brother was Will. Will and George took off from the Black Plantation, which was in fact, of course, after the emancipation, they were actually purchasing the little place where they lived. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting story when I talk about my grandfather who could talk to me and tell me about his, not only his, his, his mother, who uh, 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 was uh, Caroline, I was with. but his father's mother was named Brina, and she is reputed to have lived to be about 116 years old. Mm -hmm. But Papa's story about Brina uh, are still very vivid <coughs> in my mind. They were obviously, uh, well, you entrepreneurial people even then, so glad to be free that, uh, that where they were purchasing, times became hard about 18, uh, about 18, um, let's, 1889. In the year 1889, he left with his father and his older brother on foot looking for a better life because things had gotten bad back there. The uh, family was behind on the payments. The plantation was still the plantation, but you were, what do you call it? The sharecropping was mm -hmm. then kind of thing. So his father decided that they would have to do better. So we, they had heard, I don't know how, about life in Winston or down in Salem. I guess it was really Salem, mm -hmm. but at any rate, they took two days. George, Will, and George Marlin, who was his dad, and left with um, three baked sweet potatoes and followed the railroad tracks from Randolph County to Forsyth County on foot, looking for a better life. I'm going to jump, us, uh, I'm going to leapfrog on over into the better life and say how the whole notion of his learning how to do this skill came about. Got here, and the reality of that was that they were, they just did odd jobs looking for work. But the walk, the walk took two days on foot, and they, they, they shared the sweet potatoes uh, until they got here. And the walk, the conversation uh, during the walk, was that we were go that it has to be something better going on, and we're going to find it, and we're going to work. We're going to find the best thing that we know how to do to work, so that we can overcome some of the hardships back at the in, in Randolph. And uh, George Marlin's idea was that the, he had the two older boys, and uh, they were also concerned about a younger brother who had disappeared from where they were. That's another piece of the story that probably isn't written anywhere. But um, 
and his mother um, was so troubled by that because her younger a younger son had gone missing at the plantation. Mm -hmm. But at any rate, they said we're we're going to inquire and find out where what what whatever we can about women and but but at the same time we must never not focus on working so that we can find a way to be able to get our get get the, get the entire family into a better place mm -hmm. so they uh, ended up not finding Webby but finding a way to be able to work <coughs> just and I think the, the, the earlier work was was in Osama, uh where they uh, did all kinds of chores then I can remember my grandfather talking about when, when the, 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 apparently it snowed deep here, but I don't know the time of year. I have to go back and research because I, some, I tell this story uh, uh, often, but things, things go missing. The reality is that the, the work was, I think Papa said that they got a, a, a job making something like 50 cents a day in board somewhere, 25, might have been a quarter a day, but they did it because it was work, it was honest, and they, were, they had a goal. They wanted to get the family moved out and they wanted to be in a place where what? There was also the possibility of education. George Marlin had said that how, how important it was. Uh, and he was even uh, lettered to some degree. I don't know whether it was Brenda or the mother or someone who had actually uh, taught them, but they, but they, they were, they, they were a, a little bit lettered but very, very keenly, I guess there was a genetic piece in the brain that had a, a, a mathematics chip. So, <laughs> so, so here we go with, with this family, with the older, old, older, older uh, men saying, we gotta find a way to, 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 to take care of the family, we gotta work, we gotta do something, we gotta get out of these conditions that we're in, we gotta find an education. So, Things got hard. What happened? The family did get moved to Winston Salem. My grandfather uh, was doing just in it, just work chores. He learned how to do um, things at the Ten Smith. I think it was the Mickey family down in Old Salem were Ten Smiths, and what they he worked for them uh, on through the time from 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 that early childhood. His father died. His brother left. Uh, his brother decided that uh, one day when things got really hard here that they had to continue to work and do everything but the, but the family something came about the family had died out so Papa and his brother Will said that uh, the same thing they they vowed that they would continue to work to do what they could to make a living to support their families and it's quoted all over some of these videos and what have you, that my grandfather said, as he shook hands with his brother and they parted, that if we, it, it looks like since everybody has died, we're not gonna be able to get an education. I wanted that more than anything. I want you to do what you can when you leave because Will had made up his mind to go further. He did go to Ohio. Papa said, and they, they shook hands and left by saying, and if we don't know A from B, we can stand up, make men of ourselves, and make somebody call us Mr. Black someday. That was the mantra. And after that, he did what he could do and ended up with a job, uh, with those jobs in Old Salem were, um, Ironsmithing or something. I know he used to. He, he definitely knew how to shoe horses, and he made tracks in the snow when it snowed in Old Salem, and the, and and did just did odd, odd jobs. Uh, and then uh, at that time was living in the loft of I think Miss uh, Aggie, uh, uh, a lady Miss Mickey's the Mickey's home. Um, met my grandma who was working for the freezer, and um, um, they were married, let's see, my grandmother was born in 1878. She was actually a year older than Papa. But at any rate, she, um, it, was, it was Mr. Someone in the Mickey family said, you two are very smart and you're very hardworking. 
And actually, my grandmama had learned how, my grandmama had probably what's the equivalent of a sixth grade education because the phrases for whom she worked actually taught her reading. And she was also a pretty smart cook. So uh, the reality about the brick making came along when uh, there was a brickyard that Pop was able to get a job and work for, and they did fairly well as a family. Uh, he married Martha, they had a family, they uh, built a house at 1100 Gray Avenue, which was a nice place. He worked and made those bricks by hand because he had taken a, a, an old mud mill that was given to him before the Depression and, and, and uh, uh, during the Depression, I think it was, that was given to him to burn for firewood. Instead of burning it for firewood, he brought it back down to the place where he did and reassembled it and started making bricks with his hands. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the life, well, the rest of the story is pretty much his. Because the whole thing in a nutshell was that it was, times were hard, that he lost the house that he built, the family was struggling, he, he had always struggled, so, uh, he t the, so I remember him telling me this story because my grandmother was very disgusted about this. They had built this lovely home and she just said, he, he said that it came down to this, honey. And his my mom was his daughter. Had, um, she, I got raised in the house with him because she just couldn't see herself going away with my father. So that was just another whole story. But she said, uh, he, he said that uh, he, her name was Martha. He said, well, Martha, things are not getting any better. And I have found this little place down here, uh, and I know these people, and I have spoken to them, and they are, they know the folks in Old Salem. He said, and I have, broken a, I have broken a deal where we can get us another little house where I can, I can go to work and we can at least plant a garden and raise our own food and do everything. So he said, he says, now, you can just listen to me. I love you with all my heart and soul. But you know one thing, I'm gonna go on down here and you're gonna come with me a book. <coughs> and my grandmama, my grandma was just, you know, they were they were like this. So mm -hmm. that she came on down that with him to this little old place down in Dreamer, which was in the country and everything, and he took that mud mill and put it back together and commenced to make it look. He <coughs> did not know where it was going, but he had the determination and he had the reputation <coughs> from the end of, of, of the 1800s and the first probably 20 years of with, into the 1900s where he was able to really, really do uh, to work and take care of a family and do fairly well. But, uh, and he did, but of course the education eluded him and that's another segue into the fact that eight out of eight children, first ones born in 1900, all of them had at least a high school diploma. Every last one of them. And there were several of them who were college. I think I had three uncles, uh, my mother and her sister who worked at the Pentagon. They, they, I mean, they, they, they were educated. By, I, I don't know, I won't say Google by crook, but they, they, they had kids. <laughs> I, I'm not sure. So, so when you think about, and, and I'm, I'm telling the early part of the story to say that there are no struggles here in 2020 uh, that, are, that are different uh, except to whatever. I, I don't even, I haven't found the word to describe what the whatever is, but the struggles of the African American uh, race are, are just, just that. They're, they're, they're to, to, to be overcome and to take your rightful place in society to do what you can do, irrespective of what others are trying to do to, put, to, to beat you down. You just, and the reality is to, to as he said, I, can, I, I mean, every time he told that story about standing up, I could see the steel in his back. Because as history would have it, that he started to, he redid that mud mill um, and made all those bricks and didn't know what was going to happen with them as he made them and burned them and stacked them to, to, to go to market. R.J. Reynolds came riding down on a horse one day talking about how many bricks can you make for me because I want to build a factory. Mm. There we go. There we go. So what do you do? You're living down here in this little god-awful place for 
then you go through your neighborhood and you've got a reputation of being a stellar citizen, say to every little young and every little kid, I want you to go to school, but in the evening when you get out of school, you got a job to do here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna show you how to do this work. So there's not a kid who through that era from the 1930s up through at least the 1960s, I would say, who went to Atkins High School or Carver High School, who in the summertime would not know. And he would he would evaluate as they came through and ask about report cards. And, ask, and he couldn't even read the report cards because he hadn't had a chance to go to school. But my mom and all the rest of them could. So he had people tell me, now how's this boy doing with such and such? And, you see, and the best ones got a job working on the free cards. That's kind of the way it was. And that happened for years and years and years and years. Jumpstart and I'm going with boom, 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 uh, when he was visited by the CBS guy, Charles Perrault, who did the Only Road thing. I think I've got the book here. One whole chapter in this book is about my grandpa and, 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 and how, he, how that whole thing happened. Because the man came at the wrong time of the year. Brickyard season had shut down, so he, and the big truck, my cousin was at the house that day. She said, Papa, there's a big old CBS thing out there, and they want to type tape and do some, to put you on television. He said, well, Ted, come on in here. He said, and the guy said, Charles Carroll said, uh, Miss Black, we want to interview, we want to see you make some bricks out of brick yard. He said, boy, brick yard season. He said, you the wrong season. <laughs> <laughs> come back in the springtime and I'll talk to you again. You can watch me work. Charles Carroll came back. All right. <laughs> That's the kind of, this is the man my grandfather was. He, there was, as there's such thing as no respect of person, but everybody is somebody. Uh, we always, I mean, it was just crazy, but it was just that way. That was, that, that's who he was. I mean, he was really an incredible human being. Every day I can think about something that, that I learned and why people say I get on with people and why I don't um, choose this one over that one or the other. It's, I mean, I, the reality is working together. And when we speak about business, entrepreneurship, um, you cannot separate that from, from decency and order in spite of what we see in the world we're looking at today. Staying focused with that which is within. And I say that it comes from your mirror images. That is why it is critical to not allow the kind of deterioration happen that has been happening right under our eyes. Uh, and, and, and the reality is that we must take charge of some of that. We must take charge and some of the responsibility for it. Uh, because we must recognize what happens when when you, as they say, the African proverb truly, uh, when spiders come together, they can tie up a herd of elephants. Mm -hmm. right. That's that. That's true. And I'm glad I've lived long enough to sort of witness that because as I took a trip to Africa several some years back, I was able to experience because there, while not necessarily going for showing and teaching the skill, although we did. That Corral trip ended up in my having to go to Washington, D.C. and to go with my family to visit with the, to the White House. This is the, uh, I hate to talk about the president that way. This is, I have better pictures, but I couldn't find them all. They're all over the place because it, it, it's, it's crazy right now. But, but, but just handle gingerly, you can just, I mean, carry it around, it's good. We went to the White House. Uh, he, they, they, I had to do all the work, I had to do the paperwork, but the whole thing in a nutshell was, went to the United States Department of State, uh, commissioned a trip to go to teach the people of Guyana, the cooperative um, uh, country in, in South America, how to make those bricks. They were, they, they were in a struggle. This is where politics comes into the fray. Into the fray. As a result of the, the, the news clip, the, the guy who sat on the Guyana desk at the U.S. Department of State said, there's this old man down there. Pops, this, this man was 92 years old when we did this. <laughs> 92. And, he was, and, and when asked if he had the possibility, if they thought he had the possibility, he 
He said, well, of course. I'm just sitting here on the porch, front porch now. He said, I'd be making bricks and somebody, if I could find somebody to work and I could stand and show them how to do it. That was in 1970, 71. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I did the, I had to do, had to write, do all this stuff. Oh, Lord, it was just, it was too much. But, but it was a lot of work. It was a lot of work. Uh, I, we worked with, um, were, um, went to Guyana, showed those people. We, we worked with, we, and we lived with the prime minister. We lived with the prime minister, stayed there, showed, made, showed them how to do it. They came back here, brought them back. We did, I, I wrote it so that we could do an exchange program so that we could determine how we could get some of our people here to see what we had done there and then infuse that entrepreneurial spirit so that somebody would want to know and understand how this stuff is done. So the reality is that we, we, we did that and it was a successful project as a result. I mean, all kinds of stuff happened. Talk about work. Uh, there's, there's stuff here that you can see. There's a statue downtown that's, that's Papa when he was, um, had his brickyard in the backyard and was hauling the bricks. Let me tell you one thing. Let me tell you, this is the other thing. As my grandma was smart lady, she kept the jar and the money. But let me tell you, you could not cheat him out of a brick because those big trucks rolled into that brickyard back then, in that little place down in Dreamland. And I'll tell you, I had an uncle who was a very good math scholar, but he would count the bricks and have the price ready in his head. Papa did before my uncle could do it on a piece of, with, a, with a pencil and a, a hand machine. So that's the kind of, you know, I mean, this this the just a true grit but also a person who, who was fiercely, fiercely, um, uh, I get, how can I say it? Equality, e equality <coughs> eluded, eluded, just eluded his whole lifetime. He didn't allow it to stop him. He was able to over, I had, let me tell you, one of the, one of the wealthiest people in this, in this town when I came, used to call me every morning that I was able to get up and rise and open my eyes to talk to me and tell me stories about my grandfather and how he was so just enamored by him and how their relationship was. I said, well, just go help somebody else. Go talk and spread the joy and do whatever. We need to do something. And I'm struggling right now to restore the place. Mm -hmm. Because it it, 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 it it was just allowed to go into shambles. We've got couple we got grants applications out all over the place and we we're re re enkindling uh, the fire that says you must you must be your own person and make for for this life what it is that that, that, that you can do. And you and it it, it will bring it, it causes attention. It makes folk come to you when you decide that you're not going to be bound by the burden. Come on now. So the reality is we were not, we were, we were definitely not, we were, poor, we were poor folks like anybody else. But what we did for the other side was my grandmother who had learned how to read and write, taught how to do, she taught my mother elocution. We, on, so when we didn't, you know, folks like to have a good time with that. I had uncles who played ragtime jazz, they, they were music. Papa played the harmonica, and I tell you, sometimes on Sundays, you would think there was a party going on at the church. <laughs> because that was, you have to, you, everybody, your life has to be rounded out. Yes. It has to be rounded out, and that is, that, that, those are bits and pieces in a circuitous way to tell you about who Mr. George Black was. And I mean, I'm walking just, I'm, I'm, I'm walking tall in his footsteps. I am one of a number of, I think there were 28 grandchildren of us and they're scattered all over the place. As a matter of fact, I just, somebody was telling me outside, one of my little cousins came down for the uh, Salem College and so she's on the board of directors there. She graduated from Salem. We got the, the right number, many of them, because they couldn't go, we had no money to go nowhere else. But they went to school <laughs> where we could, and where we could pay as you go, and all kind of stuff like that. Uh, but, but creating relationships, not backing down off of anybody in the principles with which you have been, you have been reared, and know that you are capable of carrying out. You've got to do, we've got to do that. Um, 
and 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 Papa just I was the lucky one because uh, my stubborn mother stayed and raised me in in the household, and that was my gift. And if I don't do something with it, it's my fault. That's it. <laughs>